there we are and we are back for another live <laughs> recording we're talking about weight weight gain weight management in menopause and how stress weaves in and out of that and if you haven't met me i'm Clarissa christiansen here on thriving through menopause and i'm joined again by my really good friend stephanie shaw from the hello hot flash podcast and hello hot flash it's great to see you again, Stephanie. It's great to see you again, too. I'm, I'm excited about today's conversation. Yes, because weight gain is big, isn't it, for women, those menopause, perimenopause years? Yeah, it's like the first thing we see and start to notice, like, what's going on? So it becomes a, a big topic of conversation. Yeah, I think um, when I had Dr. Alicia Jackson here on the show and you know from ever now she's done these great surveys like hundreds of thousands of women across the u.s and they were saying that the number one concern uh after heart flashes is weight gain uh, and that it's big in perimenopause it goes on into menopause it's one of those that just keeps going whereas some of the others they fade away and new stuff comes along that you know weight gain is there and i think I don't know about you, but I've heard that women today could be putting as much as 20 pounds on um, in menopause. That's a lot on frames, especially if you have a smaller frame and you think about holding on to, to that weight. Mine comes in my chest area and in my stomach. <laughs> and I feel it. I feel the way that I walk differently. I feel differently about, you know, what you're wearing and so forth. So it can be a really huge struggle during perimen during peri and postmenopause. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, if our clothes don't fit nicely and we've got this poochy stomach, we, we just don't feel good about us, do we? Yeah. yeah. There's that loss of confidence, loss of motivation. And sometimes it, we get to the point or can get to the point where we're just like, okay, we just give up. And so when you keep eating all of the things we talked about yesterday and that you talk about so much on your podcast, all of the other stuff starts to happen as well. So the weight becomes like this downhill dive that we take often so yeah <laughs> yeah but you know maybe we should dive in a bit more i mean what is going on with our medicine yeah. when we go into menopause perimenopause so. so part of it is we I, I we blame estrogen for everything but that's because it's, it's to blame for everything <laughs> So we have a decrease in estrogen and progesterone, and it's along with us aging and so many other things that go on, it starts to trigger these different changes that we have. And so one of the main changes that take place is a change in our muscle mass. So I, I know you've talked about it. We've all talked about the idea that um, when our, we lose muscle mass, it's easier, the weight starts to come on. So how important it is for us to make sure that we're continuing to exercise, lift weights, even as we age, you may think, oh, I'm, you know, in my 50s, 60s, why am I lifting weights? Because you want to make sure that your muscles stay strong and healthy, and that's going to support you as you start to try to lose weight. Again, the muscle mass, it causes fewer calories to actually be burned. And so we end up in this very, very vicious cycle. There's also other things that play, come into play, like genetics. So sometimes it's just your genes that are you're one size or another based on genes. I always say, thank goodness for my mom's genes. <laughs> G-E-N-E-S, not J-E. Uh, so, um, but yeah, genetics comes into play. Another thing is lack of sleep. So all of these things are throwing our metabolism off. We can't, we are uh, are not eating the proper foods. We're not moving right. We So all of these things are throwing everything off. Again, with the changes in estrogen and progesterone, and that is causing us to have the weight. We're just me not metabolizing the food in a manner that we normally would in the past. And I know another huge yeah. issue with keeping that weight on is the fact that we're so stressed out. And stress plays a huge role in that weight. Talk to us a little bit about that as well. Yes. I mean, I would just like to say one thing to start that off is that stress is nutrient depleting. So if you're highly stressed, even if your diet was amazing, you'd still be becoming depleted in vital nutrients, particularly micronutrients like an iron and magnesium. And of course, we know magnesium is super important for um, us in terms of our sleep. 
if yeah. nothing else, and, and unfortunate in many other regulatory processes, but sleep is a big one. So stress is really unhelpful. And, and if we're stressed, we find it much, much easier to need to crave foods that are going to give us that quick hit. Because when we're stressed, the body is going, give me sugar, give me sugar, you know, at first. So then we give it sugar and it goes, better hold on to that. And it right. stores it as fat. So, you know, it's your brain telling you this. And you mentioned estrogen. Well, one of the things we often forget is that estrogen is a precursor for serotonin. And serotonin is all soothing and calming and happy. And one of the roles of serotonin is to regulate our appetite. So if we are stressed and we've also got less estrogen, we're producing less serotonin, and boy, is it easy to head for those sweet, high-processed foods that are going to give us the sugar hit, but they're sometimes also going to give us a bit of a dopamine hit. And that's why, ladies, you are craving sugar. Yeah. You are craving sugar because sugar gives you a bit of dopamine, and it's going to also give you a little bit of magnesium. So the, the stress drops temporarily yeah. <laughs> thanks to the chocolate, yeah. but really long-term, all you're doing is putting down fat on the body, which we don't. Like you said drops temporarily because if you think about when you're eating something sweet, you're kind of thinking like, oh, this is so good and I feel so good. But then think about what happens like 10 minutes later, you feel stressed again or you, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it, it comes back. Yeah, it's a cycle. Yeah, and we can we can see it. You know, not just our muscle mass is changing, but we get too much fat, and fat's hard to burn, isn't it? Compared yeah. to our carbohydrates, and if we have a lot of fat in our bodies, it's like slow burn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but you know, some of the nutritional challenges. Tell me what some of those challenges are that we face, and how do we overcome them to manage our weight? So, yeah, so just like I said before, we are starting, we, as we age, we metabolize our food differently. So fats and just like you mentioned, sugar, they get processed very differently in our body. So think about at your 21-year-old self eating burgers, fries, pizza, drinking a beer, and having a milkshake all in one night. What happens? You might have a bloated stomach, and then the next morning you wake up and you're the same size. Do that when you're perimenopausal and 20 pounds are on your body and they never go away. So we metabolize food differently. And so I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of things that we need to watch out for and then some things that we can do. Sugar always comes up. It's a big culprit in um, us as we begin to age. So be really very careful about the sugar that we eat. And some foods that we eat that we may think are quote unquote good for us, some of the carbohydrates that we eat can trigger the sugar craving. So a lot of the white crates like olives and um, baked potatoes, baked white potatoes, white is pasta, they can actually trigger us to have more sugar craving. So being careful and cognizant of those as well. Processed foods, uh, anything in a can, multiple ingredients. We talked yesterday about shopping that perimeter of the grocery store, and that's where you're getting your good food. And even caffeine. So if you're, um, you have a lot of caffeine intake, that can trigger um, your appetite to go toward foods that are less healthy for you. And so one, a couple of things that you can do is start to focus on phytoestrogen-rich foods. We know that that's important. I always say eat the rainbow because a lot of people are like, I don't want to eat vegetables because I don't like green beans. Well, <laughs> there are purple, red out of fruits and vegetables, purple, red, blue, orange, green, yellow, white, you know, there's so many different types of foods and fruits. And I think there's, is there 2000 different vegetables and categories or something mm -hmm. like that? There's some crazy number. I'm like, that's, that's crazy when you break down all the different species and so forth. So if you don't like green beans, there is something else you can try. And once you start to eliminate some of that sugar and so forth, you'll realize that your tomatoes are super sweet. Bell peppers are super sweet. Beets are incredibly sweet. So starting to replace the foods will help with the metabolism in your body as well. But it still doesn't, um, as yeah. talk, I'm talking about some of that, but I like to, I want you to tell us a little bit about like the micronutrients. So I talk more about my, my proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. But when it relates to micronutrients, how does stress actually 
impact those? Well, it tends to deplete them in the body. So, I mean, obviously we have vitamins, we have minerals, and, and some vitamins are, as we know, water soluble. So vitamin C is a good example of a water soluble. And so you have to keep eating that, right? So you want to get that in your body. Sorry, folks, there's no, no way to around that than to eat some vitamin C rich fruit and veg because that's how you're going to get that into your body. And as we said yesterday, not juice because yes. juice is just like you might go drink juicily. And I, and I have to say, you know, I worked for brand Coca-Cola, so I was on the evil side <laughs> for a while. And, and you know, juice is just, you know, you could just as well drink a can of Coke. And you say, oh, no, I don't drink full sugar Coke. Well, you know, your glass of morning orange juice has just as many teaspoons, if not more, than, than a Coke does. So it's not a good option. So eat your fruit. And that's the way... But then you have other vital things that it's depleting. And those are often, as I said, zinc and magnesium. And they play such a vital role in lots of important enzymaticuses in your body, in the production of these neurotransmitters, in the synthesis of hormones. So if you're depleted those because of stress and your diet isn't that great, mm -hmm you're going to find that your body isn't making vital things it needs. And one of the ways that can show up if you're short on zinc and magnesium is brain fog. So we think well, it's all to do with estrogen. Well, stress is also a major to brain fog because you're having issues with your cortisol and adrenaline synthesis. And magnesium is playing, particularly magnesium is playing a big role in we forget about magnesium, but it's good if you're not sleeping at night as well. Magnesium, you, I would always add, when you do that litany of tests, the blood work you do once per year, I never remember magnesium being one of the things that they test for. So you always have to make sure that you're, you're asking for that to be part of your testing as well. Because I found for me personally, I, I'm sure it helped with stress as well, but it, it was, my sleep was being impacted. But stress causes you not to sleep so essentially it was all all in there together but magnesium is powerful yes. it is and and um sometimes combined with taurine which is an amino acid the two together which someone like laura bride dr laura bryden who's obviously a really famous functional medicine practitioner recommends is to take those the to really help your sleep it's like taking it to the next level if you can't sleep so yeah magnesium in the form of magnesium glutate glutinate definitely yeah so th those are just some of those but i was going to ask you a little bit more as well about vital strategies or foods that we can use so if we're trying to get more micronutrients trying to get more fruit and veg what else can we be doing around that weight gain so i think one of the first things you do when you are gaining weight is you decide to stop eating. And that is the worst thing that you can do. You either go on this major fast or you decide I'm only going to eat one or two meals per day or I'm going to stop eating at a snooze just so I can um, make sure that I'm losing weight. And I think that is one of the worst things that we can do for our bodies because it's not while we're talking about weight and you know, we want to look good. We, we also want to feel good inside. So I think that grazing is part of what I call it because we do a lot of that around my house. But doing that is much, much better. So I have this rhythm that I try to keep, but wake up in the morning, first 20 minutes, drink some water that's the same temperature as the inside of your body, either with some ginger or some lemon. Um, a lot of people like tea, so a, a, not a bag of tea, but maybe you have some fresh herbs that you can infuse into some water and drink that. And then breakfast, remember that we're, we need proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. So that can come in the form of eggs and vegetables, quinoa and vegetables. Breakfast needs to break your fast. So it could be a sweet potato in the morning with seeds and nuts in that sweet potato. Um, then a snack. We often, we think that, oh, as a kid, um, we give our kids snacks and we don't remember that we uh, ourselves need snack during the day. So celery and nut butter, fruit and yogurt, um, an apple and nuts, you know, and then for lunch, making sure that we're getting, again, that carb, protein and fat. So quinoa with vegetables or a really, really large salad. And if you think about it, I haven't mentioned meat as one of the proteins. Now it could be, but in my mind and for my clients, I normally have them 
make meet one of their, either their lunch or at their dinner time. So that's where you're getting your meat mm -hmm. protein. Lunch and breakfast, we still cover protein. We just didn't use a meat protein, which can be quite heavy. And also, it's um, if you're not going to make the investment in the meat protein, <laughs> I'll put it that way, um, then it can <laughs> not always be healthy for you because some of the larger fridges, they have, you know, the animals have had antibiotics and so forth. That's a, a whole nother subject, but just being careful about the meat protein that you eat is important. And then at night, for stress relievers, you know, drinking a cup of tea or chamomile with chamomile tea or lavender. So throughout the day, getting enough food so your body's balanced and you're getting the nutrients that you need is super important. And what I've found is clients who actually take this advice and eat all day, eating healthy, but in proportion, um, eating all day, they, they start to lose weight and they're and completely in awe that I'm eating more. And, and losing weight so that that's super important to do that yeah, yeah I, I think that that's really really true because I think lots and lots of women skip breakfast that seems to be a meal that just goes out the window because we're so busy we're trying to get other people out the door in the morning uh, or some women just think oh I don't feel like it but then we run on empty till the middle of the day or maybe even till the middle of the afternoon and that's then we start filling up on junk yeah yeah and that it's so easy to do because you're starving at that point so you start to fill up quick and it impacts our gut health as well we know our gut is our second brain and that relates to all the stress so talk to us a little bit about that like our gut health and how that um, impacts stress in our lives yeah i mean our gut is i mean inside our gut are no billions of bacteria and they're not and other organisms, because we forget that they're also fungi, and and they're a whole little little living thing inside yeah. us that weighs a lot. Those microbiomes are microbiome is actually taking care of our gut. It's keeping us healthy. It's processing, helping us to process our food, moving our food properly through the gut, so it comes out at the end in the right way, and we've extracted the nutrients we need from it. And of course. It produces its own messengers. It's part of that process of the neurotransmitter process. So there's a relationship between your gut and your brain. They're talking to each other all the time. So if your gut isn't working really well, your brain isn't going to function very well. And then menopause, perimenopause, it's really super important to take care of your gut because there's a part of our microbiome that's called the estrobilome. Mm. And the estropolome's job is to process and eliminate estrogen. So if you're having hormonal fluctuations and imbalances and your estropolome is not working properly, you are going to feel that. You're going to feel the effects of, of the fluids. You're also going to feel the effects of if you've taken, and we talked about toxins and, and various other things, they're called xenoestrogens. They look a bit like estrogen, but they're not. And if that gets out of balance and you've got all these nasties and it'll infect your estrobilome and you won't be able to process estrogen properly through your body. So your microbiome is really, really important for your whole health. And if it's not working, you'll know that. It will show up in bloating, in constipation, in IBS type symptoms. And that's, you know, I'm sure, Stephanie, you see that with your clients, that this is what many of them are experiencing. Yeah, yeah. Once, again, once you start eating that healthy, balanced diet throughout the day, that completely changes your gut health. So, yeah, that's important stuff. Important stuff. It re it really, really is important stuff. So, I mean, you mentioned eating like properly through the day. Um, I'm going to ask you about intermittent fasting because that has become incredibly popular and cautious. so. Yeah. From from your perspective as an experienced person. What would you be saying to somebody who thinks this might be the solution to their weight management? I think just like with everything, it's kind of individualized. So when I was having a ton of struggles, I did some intermittent fasting because my body needed to rest. I had so much processed sugars and fats and all just all the junk in my body, so I needed to rest. But I didn't uh, fast like full days of not eating. In my mind, a fast is so maybe you stop at seven or eight o'clock at night and then you eat again at seven or eight o'clock in the morning. 
So it's more of that 12 hour process. So it's that sleeping time where you're resting anyway, and you're allowing your body to rest as well. And then instead of like fasting food, I would fast toward fasting certain things sometimes like maybe someone that does a meat protein maybe they eliminate the meat protein and tighten get their protein from vegetables and also making sure they're getting their b supplements because you can't get it all from from just vegetables but um maybe fat uh, uh, the meat protein for a day or two just to get the stomach and gut settled and so it, again, it, I think it depends. I think it depends on where you're at, what you need to do, how bad you are. If you're having really bad gut issues, it may be good that you rest for a while. But again, that rest doesn't mean stop eating. It may just be stop eating after seven at night and then start eating again the next morning. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice because we are in, uh, individuals. I mean, I find the 12-hour fast, like you mentioned, works for me mm -hmm. because then I... I kind of find I stop eat. I try and eat my dinner a little bit earlier and around, you know, seven ish at the latest. And then I won't eat again for at least 12, uh, at least 12 hours. And that works for me. Um, but some people go 16 and eight and some people can go, you know, only 10 hours or whatever. But I think the, the message is try and give your gut a, gut a bit of a time to rest, to digest. And, and and really process through all the food you've put into it and and then you know then eat again sort of i think 12 hours is a good time you know stop eating and of course if you've got other issues <laughs> as we all know like acid reflux and the like then you do want to stop eating before you go and lie down and acid reflux is very common isn't it and people take that is not good for your bones yeah yeah that that's super true as well and, and back to that, like extended fasting, I don't know if it's just me, but I can tell when people are either a hardcore runner or if they're a hardcore faster. There is something in your cheekbones and it just looks like, um, I don't know, it's just something in your face that looks a little more hollow. And I'm not saying anything right, wrong or indifferent about it, but I think I would think about that and how it's impacting your overall body. And, and, you know, there may be a period of time, just like I said, I was really sick. So I had to be really focused and do this for a period of time. But as soon as I got start feeling better and my gut got healthy again, then I just went back to, to more of a normal living. That I'm not sure I'm comfortable with people doing the 16 hour for the rest of their life. Do you know what I mean? I, again, no, it's individual, no. but that's just, in, that's my mindset around it. Yeah. And I, I would agree with you. I think that might be really good for a short term. It's a bit like people who, maybe um, go totally keto for the rest of their life. And it might be a really good thing to do for some people for a short period of time to re reconnect and rebalance and then find a more mixed and diverse diet that works for them. That, and but that's life as well. Like if you, do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm starting to think about like a journal. So doing things for an extended period of time, sometimes just there's seasons, there's seasons of life. So when there's seasons of life where you want to volunteer a lot or seasons of life where you want to relax more or seasons of life where you want to just go hardcore in your family and only do family time, nothing else. I think that's the same thing with our bodies. We have to recognize what season we're in and do what's best for our body in that, that season. Sometimes our body needs a little, you know, mixing up. <laughs> So in order for it yeah. to, to heal itself. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's, that's very good advice that we have to listen to our body, listen to where we are and do what we can. And I think the diet industry has made women believe they have to be thin and this and that. And, and that's, you know, had all its own issues and mm -hmm. is causing a lot of issues even now. I mean, you know, I did a, an episode here with, Anne Wilson, and she's a pharmacist and a nutritionist, and we talked about a Sempic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, lots of women um, taking this to lose not, you know, 20 pounds, but lose six pounds mm -hmm. and really causing themselves a lot of issues. So I definitely recommend you tune into that podcast and listen. And I think more than anything, we will put on some weight. We will change as we get older. And it's the difference between what is maybe acceptable and not unhealthy weight gain and what is too much that's going to tip us into a longer-term health issue. 
Yeah, and I so we get. I think um, I'm reading this book, and then yesterday we're we're getting ready to do some work in the kitchen. So I get this magazine on to pick out faucets and so forth. So I'm looking through the the book, and I see all different people, all different body sizes. I'm like, wow, they're like the media is starting to get it. I hope, which hopefully means the next generation as they're coming up, they won't feel this burden to be a size zero, recognizing that that's even in the industry. I usually wear two or three different clothing lines. Like, I know that I weigh way more than I did when I started wearing this clothing line, but yet I'm still in the same. So even they're tricking our minds <laughs> to think that we're, you know. So once we can get it, it's more than just the eating, it's the mindset as well. So stress, it's the mindset. What you're eating, it's all the mindset. So when we can start stepping away from that, I think we'll be a lot better off. And I'm happy, once I again, the media, the media is kind of trying to get it. And if you're caught up, Stay off Instagram for like, you know, six months and you'll, you'll start to feel better about yourself. It's so lovely to talk to you. Do you have a final message for the, for the people who tuned in today? Yeah, love yourself as you are because you are simply amazing. That's so beautiful. Well, I hope our listeners have enjoyed, you know, us talking over the last few days about our skin, our weight and our stress because that this is big uh, parts of this perimenopause menopause years and we love your questions so do ask us anything and both Stefan and I will definitely respond and and answer your questions because we because we're very passionate about menopause aren't yeah. we Stephanie I'm very passionate <laughs> we're going to sign off and say thank you for joining us today thank you Stephanie for joining me thank you